Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our cities, or in other words, their resource use and pollution emissions, and how to reduce them in a systemic, socially just, and context-specific way. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities, and on today's episode, we will talk about the future of cities. You will all have probably heard that most of global population now lives in cities and that the rate is going to increase very rapidly in the near future. But what if I told you that everyone on this planet will live in cities by 2100? Imagine all the implications this could have and all the subsequent questions that will follow. For instance, where are those cities are going to be situated? How big these cities will be? Uh, will they co continue expanding on old cities? Will they be new cities? Well, to talk about this fascinating topic, I have Michael Batty, which is an urban planner, geographer, spatial data scientist, and a professor at the Bartlett School uh, of University College London. He has been the director and now chairman of the CASA, so Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis. Uh, and his research was uh, and still is on computer models focused on uh, city systems. He has been the author of numerous books, which I've read over the years, uh, such as Fractal Cities, Cities and Complexity, The New Science of Cities, and the, the latest one, uh, Inventing uh, Future Cities. Just before kicking off this episode... I'd like to make a small request. So if you like this podcast and this episode, just share it around with your friends and colleagues. I think many of you will find this interesting. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please make sure to subscribe to our channel and support this podcast by sharing it along. With all that being said, hi, Michael. And could you please uh, briefly uh, introduce yourself and your research? Yes, thank you, Ariste. Um, uh, as you say, um, I've worked for a long time on what I loosely call the science of cities, which is to try and develop more formal approaches, uh, but nevertheless still practical, formal approaches to thinking about how we can think about, understand and forecast, uh, predict in some sense, uh, the future of cities in this context. Uh, and a lot of the focus that I've been involved in uh, draws ideas from the physical science. That doesn't uh, the whole social dimension of cities is missing in some sense. It's just that the emphasis in, in the kind of work that I'll be talking about, um, it's very much to do with um, how we can formalize in some sense, at least to begin to think and understand what goes on in cities to formalize the different relationships, the different processes. Uh, and for example, um, one of the kind of key features of this podcast series is the idea of circular metabolism. Of course, in this context, metabolism means the sort of processes uh, that go on in a particular system or ecosystem in that sense. They're the processes wh whereby you get uh, growth and change um, in general. Um, uh, and the functioning of the cities, uh, the functioning of the system in this particular context. And inevitably, metabolism um, is very much involved with the way energy is actually transformed and used within any system. Now, we do take that um, specific kind of focus to some extent in developing a science of cities. The other key issue, uh, which again relates quite strongly to this, is that um, metabolism is really related very much to the kind of complexity of how these processes maintain themselves, how the processes which are involved in cities lead to new growth, regeneration, and so on. And metabolism um, in, in, in this particular context is very much related to another theme that has emerged over the last probably 30 or 40 years, that's maybe more over 30 years, uh, which is complexity theory in that sense. So the idea that systems that we deal with cities in particular in this instance, are complex. They're increasingly complex as we invent new things in this particular way. Um, and therefore, we need quite powerful techniques and, and uh, uh, models to actually deal with it in that sense. So that, in a nutshell, is really the position from which I actually come to 
um, uh, talk about these ideas um, this afternoon. Yeah, I, I, I was wondering if you could perhaps take us back because, of course, urban, uh, you were trained as an urban planner. And of course, back in the day, computer science and urban planning were not necessarily in the same room. And uh, of course, CASA does this, but I, I, I was wondering, so I can imagine that geography back in the day used GIS, so some sorts of computers, mm -hmm. But when did this um, use of computer models in urban planning or city making started to, to exist? Well, actually, um, the origins are a long time ago. In fact, almost as soon as computers got invented, to give some context about this, generally speaking, I and most other people who've looked at the history of computing know the little computer was invented in the middle of the 20th century, about 70 or 80 years ago, essentially, during World War II. World War II gave a massive boost to the whole notion of digital thinking in this sense. But of course, the computers that were invented in those days were very much scientific instruments in, in this particular context to enable people to do scientific compu computation, basically. Um, and um, and unsurprisingly, at the time, uh, there were a lot of defense uh, related applications of computing. The initial computers that were built in Britain and Germany and uh, the United States were essentially financed uh, because of the war effort. Uh, but as soon as computers are invented, um, the, um, uh, some of the pioneers, such as Alan Turing and um, John von Neumann, these were people who thought about computation from an abstract point of view. Um, they began to make the point that the computer was a universal machine. Uh, and this was a very hard thing to take because it really meant that um, if it was a universal machine, it could only begin to operate or, um, or simulate a, a, a real system if everything could be reduced ultimately to zeros and ones, the binary code. And this was a, a very hard thing to take when all one had really was numerical calculations on at that particular point in time. The idea that computers could actually produce pictures, uh, this was in the middle of the 20th century, was, was very unusual, although there were glimpses of these possibilities. The idea of computers producing music and so on was uh, really very much on the back burner. But as soon as computers began to uh, be developed, it was very clear that they that one could store enormous quantities of data. And so there's an immediate commercial application, IBM, for example, which had, which had manufactured uh, electronic calculators in the 1920s and 30s, basically picked up just after the war on the development of these new mainframe machines, basically, and they became the biggest computer company in the world by the mid-1950s. And in the mid-1950s, there were a lot of business applications. So you had scientific applications and you had transactions processing for business in this particular context. And it was pretty natural that people thought about other sorts of scientific systems, such as economic forecasting and so on, um, in this particular context. Now, of course, in the United States during the 1950s, the other thing that was happening was a very massive move towards um, you know, urban sprawl and the automobile and so on in this particular context. The interstate highway system was developed in the mid 1950s. Um, and as part of that, the kind of complexity of all these things um, was picked up by people who, who began to think about building computer models. So the first wave of computer models in cities was in transportation in the 1950s. The Chicago Area Transportation Study Commission, CATS, basically in the mid 50s, basically were built a variety of different models, population, um, employment, obviously transportation, which was the focus in this sense, um, in that sense. And, and really by the 1960s, we had land use transportation models. Uh, and these models were um, very different from what we see today in the sense that um, uh, you really, there was no visualization. If you wanted to draw a map of the output, basically, then it had to be done by hand. Um, a lot of the processing was... Uh, uh, was done um, uh, very laboriously. So, for example, punch card and punch tape took the data input and the programs and so on. Uh, and the mainframe machines actually, you know, uh, these were fed to the, the main computers. And then a day or so later, you would get the output. So it was a very, very different world in that sense. If you looked at 
the process of building a computer model back in the 1950s and 60s, um, then it would be very arcane compared to today. You would be surrounded by punch tape and punch cards. Uh, the whole process would be based on trying to get the model to work without actually a, a, a demonstrating any errors. Um, in other words, if the model um, kept producing errors, then you know, and it only you were only able to get one run a day over 24 hours. It would take ages to get models to work. So there was a very different emphasis from today. Whereas if we get errors when we program, basically we simply dismiss them and move on and move on and find a way around them. In that sense, there was really much less of that, and so consequently the the focus was very much on on building the models right the first time. But the biggest single problem was that these models were data hungry um, at the time, which was tiny compared to what sort of computer time is now used with these models. But basically the experience was very salutary that in other words, there was a rise and fall of these sorts of models in the 1960s. And by the 1970s, lots of other things had come onto the agenda. So in the 1970s, um, the land use transport models really went onto the back burner. And um, uh, what really emerged were other ways of using computers within cities. So geographic information systems, GIS, which you mentioned, uh, which is really to do with the representation of things, that really began to take off. And that took off largely because graphics came onto mm -hmm. the, into the picture. Mainframe machines got scaled down to personal computers. In personal computers, you always had a part of the memory was graphics in that sense. So gaming really began in a big way. And consequently, GIS really um, came out of the idea of automated cartography um, and therefore, and then spatial analysis in that sense. So then there was that. And then, of course, in the 90s, uh, we had um, interactive computing, the web and so on, um, and web pages and the dissemination of ideas uh, about cities, you know, public participation and so on. So you can think of every aspect of computing as somehow influencing what was going on in cities. Now, this does not mean to say that um, uh, what was going on in this context was necessarily the, the right or the best thing in some sense. Many of the models were uh, based on really rather poor theory. We've not really still got, we've still not really got good theory when it comes to understanding cities in that sense. That's, that's one of the purposes really of, um, you know, the sort of work I've been doing really, and, and many of my colleagues too, to think about a science of cities so that we can actually take things forward a bit more. question of good theory, uh, and of course, in a context where there are many different perspectives on cities that we can't ignore all of these different perspectives. We have to integrate them in some sense. And of course, the idea of circular metabolism is to some extent thinking about integration as, as such in that sense. So, so all of these things were really sort of um, elements that, that I've worked on over my career really in that context, starting with um, you know, the, uh, the the big kind of lumbering dinosaur type models from the 1960s. They're not big. They're tiny compared to our models now, but they were big in terms of the amount of effort and scale that's had to be put into them. So that's really from where we came in this sense. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating, especially as you say, that sometimes we just deal with a with an issue or a challenge just because we have that tool, you know, with a uh, when you have a yeah. hammer or problems or nails somehow, um, and I guess the city has suffered as well with um, subsequent theories that kind of sometimes say that the city is a machine or sometimes says that the city is an organism and stuff like that. And we we kind of see that the integration of challenges mm -hmm. come also based on our definition of a city, of our theory of a city and all of that. And I can imagine that very rapidly you focused on linking cities with complexity as well. Um which I imagine also emerged in similar times. I mean, complexity theory and and computers also were hand in hand in the 60s or 50s. D did you directly mm -hmm. make the connection between complexity and cities? Well, not particularly me, but the, the what really happened in the mid 20th century that, you know, I read the 20th century in terms of the social and physical sciences uh, as one where... Um, the physical sciences made great strides in the 19th century and then 
uh, with the development of quantum and in, in relativity in the early 20th century. Um, and many people in the social sciences, particularly in the United States, um, began to think that, that, that the social sciences should also aspire to uh, a scientific paradigm in that sense. And so consequently, economics was the one that began to change first and became essentially in the late 19th, early 20th century, fairly mathematical in many senses, very mathematical subject in some senses still today. Um, uh, and so you got this transition towards a more harder social science. And that led um, in the 1950s, really, um, to what was loosely called the systems approach. In other words, if you had a a problem, a system, which um, was not very well structured, not very well disciplined. The city would be a very good example, right? It, unlike a, a, a physical system of, um, you know, atoms and molecules and things of that sort, which were rel relatively simple, but can be treated in a very complex way. Uh, cities were a much more sort of vague sort of animals, basically. They're still systems, there's still structure, and a lot a lot of areas like this were subject to the so-called systems approach. You define a system, you define the system's environment. Uh, that's the input and output between the system and the rest of the world. Um, uh, you look at the subsystems and there's a hierarchy of these subsystems and so on. This was the terminology of the systems approach. And of course, you can, having heard what I've just said, you can apply that to a whole range of different systems from the economy to uh, the city to a psychological system, you know, to our physiology and so on. And so the systems approach, the systems approach was that it really downplayed the idea of dynamics or change, the change from one system to another, uh, which was really all important in terms of metabolism, for example, change is absolutely essential to noting the way different processes um, take place within any particular system in that sense. So consequently, the first change in the system, the development of the system approach was, was, the, was the, the movement to begin to think about dynamics, basically. And there were lots of ideas in mathematics going on in the 1970s and the 80s to some extent related to dynamics, related to change over time. Catastrophe theory got invented in the 60s. Um, chaos theory in the 70s uh, and uh, this does not uh, the chaos theory or catastrophe does not mean randomness it means sort of uh, uh, a way of um, uh, thinking about how systems develop really uh, with a degree of unpredictability uh, but not necessarily a random unpredictability so um, in some senses all of this mathematical machinery and physical machinery was put together. Uh, and a number of people, mainly in physics and in, um, and to some extent in biology, but physics and economics really, uh, got together in the United States and, and they developed the idea of complexity theory. There are many, many contributions to complexity theory in this particular context, but mainly the development came at the Santa Fe Institute largely. That became the focus in the United States for the development of complexity theory in terms of economic systems and then social systems, but also things like city systems and so on, um, as well as various sorts of uh, physical systems from the physical sciences, basically. So uh, complexity theory became a fairly comprehensive view about how you treated any kind of system, really, whether it be a, a physical system or a social system. Uh, and of course, in planning, or rather in cities, I should say, um, cities became um, very good candidates, if you like, for uh, the study of these complex processes in that sense. It's, it's, they're, they're very good analogues, really, um, for um, the systems, uh, for the uh, uh, complexity approach generally. All the features about a complex system, how it evolves from the bottom up rather than top down, um, so there's a degree of uncoordination at the bottom up, but it leads to pattern and order as we develop the system. A, a very good example is, would be to look at the um, uh, any kind of um, remotely sensed image of a large city 
you know, the n- n- night lights photographs from Na- NASA, for example, and you would see that nobody planned it at that level. It's like an evolving biological system. And the analogy that cities were more like biologies, they were more like organisms really than they were like machines really came onto the agenda you can loosely think of the systems approach as thinking of the world as being made up of machines manufactured from the top down whereas cities are really built from the bottom up they evolve rather than being manufactured they actually evolve in this particular context so that's a very good way i think of of noting the difference and the development of these things over the last 50 years in that way yeah, and especially I think you, we, we had also um, Geoffrey Wester lately on this podcast talking about mm-hmm. scaling laws and also how this bottom-up approach of cities. And I, 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 I think somewhere in this Inventing Future Cities book, you mentioned that um, cities are getting complex at a faster rate than our understanding mm-hmm. is uh, able to yeah. keep up with. And I think that that is quite... Um, not frustrating, but it, sometimes scary for us uh, researchers. You know, uh, how do we, yeah, yeah, yeah. we yeah. are always chasing after this ever evolving uh, element. Sure. And I'm wondering, do, do you have, could you perhaps elaborate a bit on this and, and how do we, sure. you know, take a stand or how do we uh, act on this? I think, yeah, I think, you know, my own view is that we really may need to make a distinction between the, um the, the 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 pre-modern world and the modern world and the modern world really dates from at least in my perception it dates from really the 17th and 18th centuries um where there was a lot of development of uh, the first ideas of physical sciences the newtonian revolution and so on uh, and then hard on the heels of that came the industrial revolution and i suppose in a sense um the Industrial Revolution marks the Great Divide, really, in that sense, that um, everything prior to the Industrial Revolution really was was very, very stable in the long historical context. So, for example, death rates, for example, remain roughly the same for uh, men and women, um, really, for probably 10,000 years since the agricultural revolution, probably 100,000 years, basically. People lived to about 25 to 30, and that was it. And that was still very much the case, you know, in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and so on. And then things began to improve in some sense that arguably it's not at all clear why things improved a bit, but there was a sort of sense of stability or if there was a sense in which we moved above the best subsistence level. And this led to the Industrial Revolution. And in many senses, that led to the invention of technologies. First of all, there was uh, mechanics, and then there was electrics, electronics, uh, and then there was the computer. And now we've just got a succession of technological revolutions, most of which really relate to uh, the original mechanical and industrial and uh, electrical revolutions um, as encapsulated in the computer, basically. So everything these days uh, in terms of revolution is digital in some sense. So at the present time, um, well, various people have talked about these waves of industrial revolution. So generally speaking, the third industrial revolution after mechanical and electrical, uh, which led to digital, basically, is the world that to some extent we operate in. But everything from now, on that third and now fourth industrial revolution, uh, which is biomedicine and digital and so on, the way computers and computation are infecting everything, basically, in that sense, organizations and so on. So in other words, what we've actually got is a series of ever faster revolutions with the technology, and the technologies don't knock themselves out. To some extent, some technologies become obsolete, but most technologies are absorbed into the growing complexity. And that's what what leads to this growing complexity. The fact that new things are being invented all the time. The complexity of the world is such that um, old things are not really thrown away. There are at least some elements maybe, but a lot of what's in old technologies is subsumed in you in this context. So we have wave after wave of technology and it becomes increasingly difficult, basically, um, 
if you're if you're changing, if the technology is changing so rapidly, uh, then even people who are trained in it and become experts become uh, it's not exactly obsolete, but they they're, they're not really aware of the new technologies, even though they may be working in the field. They don't have enough time to actually be able to absorb these new technologies. And that's particularly true in terms of computation. You can actually see that writ large uh, across the way we use computers uh, and technologies in science and social science, you know, at the present time. So this is what I mean by the increasing complexity of things. Uh, the other feature, of course, is that arguably the world is getting wealthier. It may not appear that way in some context, but generally speaking, um, uh, 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 right, falling uh, death rates and uh, modern medicine, globalization generally in some aspects has led to um, increasing opportunity. And if you give people more opportunities, then they invent complex things, basically, or more complex things. And in that sense, this is what I mean by um, things getting more complex in this particular context. And in terms of understanding cities, many of these uh, new technology that are being invented are being embedded in some sense into cities. I mean, if, if you think of the simplest distinction between um, the way we looked at cities in the long term, uh, what I like to call the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, not, the not the short term city, but the long term city, basically, uh, in this sense, the the short term city is the 24 hour city, basically the smart city uh, in that context. Now, that's all emerged in the last 20, 30 years as computers have scaled down to embed the buildings, basically. Um, uh, then we're using computers to model cities, but we're also using computers to model cities that are actually composed of computers in that sense. So there's this mixing uh, that's gone on, which is quite problematic in terms of getting a handle on it. And of course, the, the revolutions that we're about to, or are already beginning to go through, are where computers are being embedded into, not into the buildings around us, that's certainly taking place uh, in the transport system and so on, but imb embedding them into ourselves, really, into the, into the natural environment and then into the human environment, basically. Um, now, it's very hard to know where all this will take us in some sense, but there is no doubt that it's increasing the level of complexity everywhere in that sense. So that's one of the reasons why I say cities are increasing in complexity. It's not that other things aren't. If we, we, we I could, you could generalize that argument and talk about society. Society is massively increasing in complexity mm -hmm. uh, in this context. New organizations being added. Um, we, we spoke before the podcast about um, uh, the use of modern software, basically. All the time, new software is being invented and people have to get with it to be able to use it in some sense. And there's only a limited amount of time in the day to actually do that. So th this is adding to the kind of complexity of, uh, of this fa fa uh, facing this mind-boggling complexity in this context. And it's difficult to know if the speed of uh, the development of new ideas continues at the rate it has been doing, then to some extent we could argue that we're, we're overwhelmed. I suppose the saving grace is that um, new people coming to what they see out there and learning from the bottom up, so to speak, are able to handle it better than people who are already part of the system in that sense. That's always been the case, you know, young and old generations and so on. Uh, so this is, this is, I suppose, what I mean by increasing complexity. And, and so that means, hopefully, the, the newer generation will better understand the complexity of, a, of the city than the, the, the older generation? Or how do we, you know, because there... Something else I have always um, encountered is that many times us new researchers kind of think that we've we found something of, or we theorized something and then we read a book and we realized that this was yeah. there already a hundred years ago. So, right. <laughs> so how do we, um, you know, orchestrate the two or harmonize the two, something that, you know, there is still some uh, in-depth knowledge that exists for years yeah. and years yeah. and centuries and still at the same time there is this complex new bottom-up elements that that are yeah, made of yeah. that you know new complex cities uh, 
uh, invent every day is, and how do we align Ooh. these two in order to comprehend the, this city or to 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 better create cities to better transform cities yeah. and stuff like that well i it, this is very this is very difficult uh, in the sense that um a lot of knowledge is built layer by layer on top of each other and you see this particularly in computing nobody really <laughs> understands how the internet works or we don't have any any neat um, laid out formalized theory of how these systems work uh, in some sense. And um, typically things that are grown from the bottom up in this way are quite hard to theorize about in this sense. Um, people coming to um, uh, the phenomena, any phenomenon without really knowing much about its history are able to accept much more than people who've actually lived through that history, I think. That's a very important issue. So for example, um, uh, if you are, in, I mean, one of the classic examples in computing is that networks are built of in layers. In fact, computers are built of as layers. Right at the bottom layer, you have the circuitry that deals with the zeros and ones. and you know, the, the experts and physicists who deal with all of that are really people who are, you know, experts in the physics of light and materials and all sorts of things like that. Nothing really to do with applications of computers, in a sense, um, that we're talking about here. And so in some senses, all of that is taken for granted. I don't know whether there would be anybody in the world who really understood how everything actually worked. I suspect that, I suspect one or two people uh, you know, a handful of people do understand, I think, uh, the way uh, computers uh, are work in terms of their, their programming right down to the basic guts of it. But even down at that level, it's now, now been so highly automated uh, that it's very difficult to kind of disentangle it all. And people don't need to, because somehow when we build the world in layers, it may not be the right way of doing it, but when we build it in layers, uh, we can accept you know, all the layers that came before. So that's one issue in a sense. You made the point about things being rediscovered. Uh, that's a very interesting issue. There are a lot of things that um, you know, have been thought about uh, in the past, basically, uh, but also there's a lot of reinterpretation that goes on. What was important you know, 30 or 40 years ago in terms of thinking about how cities are structured is perhaps no longer important. So, for example, um, when I was a graduate student, basically, things like transportation flow, um, transportation flow, the structure of cities where city centres were, and, and so these were all really quite important things that you could manipulate by models, in a sense, and make forecasts for, and plans were organized in that way. Today, there's much more concern for the social structure of cities, even in spatial analysis, the social structure of cities, much less concern about some of these big questions about movement. And of course, what has happened is that cities themselves have changed. No longer do people think about moving in cities in quite the same way. There's lots of different sorts of movement patterns, which are now um, uh, important in the context of cities. And that's, a, and that's reflected in what people study. So for example, if you look at um, uh, the number of people who are working with smart card data and transit systems, it's enormous, right? It's out of all proportion to the number of people actually traveling, right, in that sense. So because smart card data is easy to get from transit systems and so on, and from mobile phones and so on. Lots and lots of people have gravitated towards that. It's not at all clear um, whether anything that we don't know already has actually been produced from all this work, basically. Um, that's a big issue. I mean, I'm not a, a detailed expert on this, but there are lots and lots of, of issues. Back in the day, we were very always very concerned about the integrity of data, whether it was a representative sample and it was almost a situation where you wouldn't work on a problem if you couldn't get what was a reasonably representative sample. 
uh, obviously the data you could get would depend on what you would study in that sense. So in other words, if you wanted to study a particular phenomenon, uh, but you couldn't get data on it, you probably meant that you, you didn't study it. Whereas today, because we can get loads and loads of this data, this massive, massive amount of data, but it's, it can be largely unrepresentative. I mean, classically mobile phone data, um, social media data is unrepresentative in terms of the age groups, for example, of people who are associated with using those, um, use those technologies generating that data. So from that point of view, there is less concern about these issues. It, it's not that the former were any more right than the, the latter. It wasn't that, you know, what was done in the past is any better than what was done now. It was a difference of in, interpretation, a difference of, you know, what turned people on in this particular context. So for example, mean, uh, and, and we still work with these, the, these tools, that generally speaking, we build statistical models. Now, you can talk to people today and you can ask them what they're doing and say, oh, we're working on machine learning. What they mean is they're working on regression analysis, basically. I mean, regression analysis with a few fancy handles, like, you know, sort of applied to a little bit more structure in the data and so on. Um, and in some senses, um, in a way, there's been a reinterpretation of what's important in some sense, uh, in, terms, in terms of the very techniques themselves in this particular way. So um, uh, I don't know whether there are many good discussions of this particular issue, but it is an important th thing to get things into perspective in that sense. No, no, no one generational group is any righter or wronger than any other in this particular context. Uh, and to some extent, it's a very good indication of, you know, how, how cities are so complex. There are so many different perspectives on looking at them in this context. Of course, with the advent of, uh, of big data and number of data centers and all that, we, we, we love the fact that we can somehow try to dilute complexity into numbers and therefore use them to do yeah. something. We don't know what exactly, uh, but you know, at least they, they help us pass time and try to, to invent or to, to, to figure out some new relationships. And over there, we, yeah. the, the whole thesis of your latest book is that you, uh, even if we model cities, we can really predict them. And so yeah. perhaps yeah. the easiest way to predict cities is by inventing them somehow you say yeah more or less i mean i, I think I, I think i say we can invent cities it doesn't mean to say that we invent better cities um uh, we can invent them and we do invent them because life goes on in that sense um but we're unable to make strong predictions for most things in cities um and it's taken a long time to realize that, I think, that partly it's due to the fact that unlike in the narrow physical sciences where we can make predictions which can be borne out um, in terms of the laboratory and so on, certain sorts of sciences, most sciences you can't make predictions either, but, in, in, uh, but uh, uh, some you can, and that they represent the sort of, you know, the peaks really of... Um, of thinking in, in physics and things like that. Um, uh, generally speaking, um, the difficulties we have over prediction um, are really that, in a sense, we, we need to think about the future. We need to predict, but we know we can't. So we need to explore it. And to some extent, we're pushed back onto this dialogue that these are tools that are not give, they're not going to give us right answers. They give us answers that uh, really dictate our our thinking that can actually lead to new thinking in some sense. At least that's the theory behind it in some sense. So it's a sort of a retreat really from this very strong positivist model uh, that one can make firm predictions in that way. I mean, one of the things that you mentioned was that um, you mentioned Jeff West and so on, uh, and you mentioned the idea of reducing complexity to a whole series of basic things. Um, I think that um, uh, one of the kind of key features that has been developed by uh, Jeff West and <clears throat> his colleagues, such as Lewis Betancourt and so on, um, they have resurrected the idea of um, scaling in terms of economics 
and also biology, allometry, uh, the idea that um, uh, the idea that Alfred Marshall talked about in the late 19th century, he was an economist at Cambridge who wrote very influential books on principles of economics. Uh, Marshall's agglomeration economies basically really related to the fact that as things got bigger, there were qualitative changes in what we could do. And really, in a sense, um, Jeff West's notion that the power law basically is a sort of a signature, if you like, of, of the relationship between the size of objects and um, how we understand them in some senses is, is quite an important, uh, an important extension, really. The idea that as a city gets bigger, you get qualitative changes. I mean, there's some very good examples of that. You know, in big cities, you have subway systems which can't really be afforded in small cities, basically. And if you if you look at that over the whole spectrum from the very biggest cities, you know, which are you know really mega cities like in the Pearl River Delta, perhaps the Netherlands um, and southern Britain, basically. Um, you get these great agglomerations, northeastern seaboard and so on. Um, very different style of life from the small town, village, even hamlet, basically, in a sense. So massive qualitative change. Uh, and that's reflected in this notion of the power law, basically, which really is just a measurement of size, in, in a sense. Uh, and so it seems to me that looking for signatures like that um, is quite interesting because it unifies, it gives a degree of uniformity, um, or at least it gives a degree of um, relationship between the sizes of different things so that you can relate them directly and look at the how the properties of them change in that sense. So, so um, power laws are good signatures, I think, of complex systems. Um, things like the fractal dimension, the the dimension which really relates to the amount of structure you have in a pattern at different spatial scales. The fractal dimension is also another signature. It's a space filling signature for how space is actually filled, basically. So there are one or two key issues of this kind that uh, are being drawn out in terms of what we would expect to see in all cities, I suppose, in a sense. The quest, I suppose, in, in a science of cities, like a science of everything, is to actually produce theories uh, and uh, models that are generalizable to a very large class of objects, basically. And one of the problems, I think, in cities is that you can see that certain things are generalizable between cities, but you can see that lots of things are not generalizable between cities. So it's this tension between... Um, knowing of a city, uh, knowing of certain stable characteristics in a city uh, and, and contrasting them with the vol more volatile characteristics or biggest differences in a sense, and beginning to construct a theory around that in some senses. But, but then, I mean, you, you go straight to, to the most difficult point, which is then what is a city? What is the functions of a city? Yeah. Um, because you, you mentioned, or a lot of people also mentioned that cities are the place where where economies of scales exist and therefore it's yeah. we pull together skills and and money and agricultural surplus in order to to make this happen um in all in, in other places uh, we say that a city should have uh, or i think you said that cities is where we have a critical mass of people in order to have city likes mm. functions but then you know what are these functions as well and and that's the i think the most intriguing question which we always boil down urban science or whatever to okay what is a city after all and yeah i mean uh, of course in some senses this is a question which is um is, is also quite a a changeable or volatile question because there's no doubt that cities through the ages have changed in terms of, I mean, they're much bigger now than they always were. Um, at one level, uh, you made the point that I make in the book that um, uh, eventually we'll all be living in cities by the end of this century. But the clear, clear issue is um, 
we'll all be living in different sizes of cities. The size distribution is probably not going to alter very much, that we're not all going to live in the biggest cities. Most of us are going to be living in smaller cities in that sense. Um, and in other words, the, uh, and the, the experience in these different places is very different, although they're united by uh, certain, you know, uh, quite well-grounded relationships such as power laws and so on, you know, hierarchical laws, and so, et cetera. Um, there's still quite profound differences between big and, and small in this particular context. And that's quite difficult to reconcile in some sense because a lot of the discussion about different sorts of cities at different sizes <coughs> is highly qualitative in some senses. Uh, and it isn't even um, a particularly uniform say, for the same city. That One of the things that's not been done much is to look at the inside of cities and to think about how some of these issues about scaling change inside a city in this context. And that really introduces this notion about, you know, where does the city begin, uh, where does the city end, and where does everything else begin? Um, because if we alter... The definition of what is a city, then um, the biggest single question then is that lots of things begin to change. Now, uh, in London, for example, in Britain, uh, there's quite clearly London um, has a much bigger impact on uh, other cities in the UK than you would find uh, New York or Chicago does on, in, on cities in the United States. That may be a scale thing, right, in a sense, but generally speaking, a lot of people in Britain believe, you know, um, ge um, geographers and so on believe that really in Britain there's only one big city and it's London. And really, if we start taking, taking London away from everything else or everything else away from London, we don't get a good explanation of London in some sense. Um, only can we begin to reconcile um, some of these changes in scale, which you see in power laws, when we begin to relax our definition of what constitutes cities in Britain in this particular context. So, and globalization, of course, is changing this all the time, basically. Increasing number of people who generate the wealth in these big cities don't live in them to some extent. So it's very difficult to equate the wealth with where it's produced. I mean, in... Um, some good examples of scaling uh, in terms of scientific papers. You'd expect um, the biggest cities to have probably more than proportionately the number of scientific papers. So there should be a power law of sorts in that sense. But in fact, uh, that often depends on where papers get classified. Apparently in the, in, in the old Soviet Union, basically, all the papers that were written by the physicists were spread right across Siberia and places, were all collected together and and, and, and catalogued in Moscow, basically. So you've got all this sort of scientific innovative stuff, which was classified, you know, in a place uh, for w where the headquarters was really in Moscow. The same in terms of retailing in Britain. So a lot of the supermarkets, for example, report their data to um, head offices. Uh, and if we want to look at the hierarchy <laughs> of supermarkets by uh, by the amount of income they have and so on. We have to disaggregate that data. We can't take the data from head office because it, it absorbs it. So in other words, the space which constitutes the city is really all important. And, and different definitions change, change the nature of what we're actually studying in that sense. I mean, arguably, uh, we may not, we may, we, cities, at the end of this century will be very different from what they were at the end of, let's say, the 17th or 18th century before the Industrial Revolution. Um, uh, and in some senses, we may even, we probably will continue to use the word city, I think, um, because it is used very generically. It's not very precise in that sense. And what we're talking about here is trying, trying to make it precise in different ways, and we get different articulations, we get different results, different ideas about a city, we classify in different ways. So what do you think this future city will look like? Do, do you mean in terms of functioning, in terms of uh, form, in terms of uh, role uh, as, you know, economic power well, or? I, I, I think there's going to be increasing differential between where people 
generate things and where they associate them with. In other words, there's going to be an increased differential between home and work, for example. Um, and uh, that, the, so in other words, breaking the link between traditionally, the, in the simplest way, the city centre and the suburbs, I suppose, in, in some respects, that that really relates to the nature of work and where work can take place in some sense. Uh, and that, that's something that, of course, the pandemic has, uh, uh, has exaggerated in many ways, although it was very much on the cards before the pandemic. There were people writing about the divorce of uh, work from home. Uh, 150 years ago, 100 years ago, um, E.M. Forster wrote a little story called The Machine Stops. And Alvin Toffler, who wrote the book the third wave in 1969, I think, and then Future Shock about 10 or 20 years later. He was very much talking about the divorce of, um, uh, of, of work from home and people working at home in their electronic cottages. And there have been a lot of studies about this break between work and home uh, in the 90s and so on. And it never really happened. If you look at the, uh, the, the, the commentary on it, it sort of says, oh, okay, you know, sort of, it's now easy to work at home, uh, but most people don't. You know, it's it's been like three to five percent of the workforce working from home for about fifty years, something of that sort. But of course, recently, uh, with the development probably of information technologies again, I mean, the very meeting we're having here, you know, on this Zoom call, is is a classic example of something that is a non-place urban realm type thing. It's a non-place, and it's the divorce of work from home, basically, in that sense. It's very interesting. So the city will change. And again, this is another quite interesting issue that when we look at cities, we don't really, we don't necessarily see what the true, what the, the deeper picture is, that the physical fabric tends to disguise what's happening underneath, really, in a sense. We've got to look under the hood much more. And that's hard, you know, especially in a global world of information technology. Actually tracking all this stuff is almost impossible, really, in some sense. So there's some big question marks about how we define the city and how we actually study it with respect to these new patterns of work and interaction and so on. Yeah, you mentioned uh, that there is, I mean, this, the city went from something being very spatial to today something non-spatial yeah. or aspatial yes, so indeed yeah. yeah um so because you say we need new ways of looking at the city understanding the city and all of that you you had an entire book called the new science of cities um i'd like just to to, to spend some more time on this and um could you perhaps share some aspects or key features oh. of of this type of science needed yeah yeah one, one of the things in that book, which has never been picked up by really anybody, I don't think, and maybe that's due to me not pushing it enough, and it's also due to it not being a very current idea. The idea is that um, when we look at relationships between objects, uh, so we might look at relationships between places within the city, um, we tend to look at the immediate effects. If you look at, divide the city up into zones and you draw a graph of transportation links, draw a network of transportation links, et cetera, then you then begin to study the network. Um, what we don't tend to do is basically predict the network, basically. We assume that it exists. The social networks, we might be interested in trying to explain, so, uh, explain who, who talks to who, but we, we don't really um, predict the actual network in this particular sense. A lot of our models to assume that the network exists, they don't predict it. In the book, I'm much more interested in predicting networks. And in the first half of the book or first third of the book, I actually introduced some ideas about how we, um, uh, how we can predict a network by taking, for example, two sets of objects. We might take workplaces and we might take home places. And if we form a matrix of who works where versus where people 
uh, live at home, basically, in that sense. Uh, that gives us a asymmetric relationship in the sense of uh, where people work and where they live are two very different sets of places. And from that data, we might be able to predict um, uh, the network itself, rather than assuming the network, actually predicting it in a sense. And so uh, that really is, is thinking of the problem as what's called a bipartite graph, as opposed to uh, a simple graph, etc. And so throughout the book, a number of models that uh, I talk about, location models and so on, really dwell on this idea of the bipartite graph, the bipartite model where uh, we don't we don't we, we don't necessarily know the network but we're able to predict it or get some handle on it by putting um, two sets of objects together which are unlike in this particular context whereas most networks in cities are put together by looking at how many people move from a to b where a and b are treated in the same way in some sense um, uh, and so that's one of the kind of key things in the book. It's a little bit abstract in some sense. <clears throat> and you'd have to dig into it and think about the graphs and so on uh, in the book. Uh, and in some senses, I, I wrote it. That there's, not, there's not much in that book, if anything, on scaling. Now, the book was written in, um, well, probably about eight or nine years ago now. Um, there's not much on scaling. We were all very aware of scaling at the time. I mean... The Lewis Betancourt and Jeff West were uh, really popularized the, the whole the new ideas about agglomeration in, in their PNAS paper in 2007 or 8, I think. Um, but there's not there's a little bit maybe about scaling, but not much. There's a little bit about power laws, but not in the same sense. Lewis Betancourt's new book, Introduction to Urban Science, is very much about scaling. The whole book's about scaling, in fact, um, in this context. So it really relates to some earlier traditions. There's a fair bit in the book on space syntax, in my book, that is, um, where space syntax is a good example of this notion of changing the focus. Uh, one of the kind of key features of the, of the of space syntax is that it does deal with bipartite graphs. It treats the nodes and the streets or the nodes and the segments um, as different sets of objects and how you put them together re really relates to the street network or the space syntax network. And so uh, it relates a little bit to that. Also, there's a fair bit of, quite, there's a little bit of stuff on space interaction. And then in the last third of the book, last third of the book really deals with something quite different. It, it deals with these same tools, but looking at almost like social networks, relationships between people who are involved in a problem of design, basically, in that sense, uh, and how you get some degree of convergence in terms of the, the mechanisms that we define on these graphs. So there's a little bit about the process. There's nothing in the book either about, there's not much at all about diffusion. If I was writing a book today, on a new science of a science of cities, if you like, I'm not sure I'd call it that, but uh, because in some senses I call it the new science of cities, but really um, it might be relatively new, but it's not the only science of cities. In fact, I think in the first few lines of the preface, I say something like, "There are many different sciences of the city." So there is one, it was completely wrong, and anybody opening the book saying, "Yeah, this is a book about one point of view." He should be sure, surely disabused by the fact that, um, although I say it a number of times, whether people take it to heart, I don't know, but it, it, it's one of many ways. And it, all it's saying is this is a new way of looking at it, pulling things together and looking at it. It's not the only way by any means in that sense. So, um, so there are a number of themes of that sort. So it's a rather eclectic book in some senses. As I say, if you're writing one today, about the new science of cities, I think you'd take a, a much more traditional point of view. Some people have done, Mark Bartholomew in, uh, in Paris has done, has done some stuff on that. He, he, I think, has taken a more classical view of this. He has a, a Cambridge University Press book uh, on, uh, uh, on some of this sort of stuff. Uh, the Louis Betancourt book is much more about um, 
about scaling, I think, of different contexts in a way. Uh, um, so, so, I mean, th th that would be my reaction to your question about what goes on in the book, The Science of Cities. Probably a, a more classic book about the complexity stuff is the previous one I wrote on, on cities and complexity, because that really is very much about, you know, what complexity is. You know, it's about bottom up, it's about path dependence, it's about um, city size and a number of other things. Um, and more importantly, this, the Cities of Complexity book um, definitely has very specific models of of cities as complex systems. First of all, there are cellular automata models, which classically are dynamic, in contrast to those models I talked about of an earlier age, the land use transport. They're classically dynamic cellular automata models. Um, they're highly formalized and so on. Uh, they're very easy to apply and to articulate. And then also that merges into agent-based models. So there's quite a bit in the book on agent-based models, really. Agent-based models being agents who sit on cells, basically, and move around, a slightly more elaborate version of, uh, of the cellular automata model. Yeah, I was, I was asking this uh, because, as you just said, uh, there's a number of people talking about this urban science or this new urban science, and everybody has a different angle and i was you yeah. know it's always yeah. important i think to yeah. to come uh, to come to this discussion by saying okay this is my point of view this is what i bring to the discussion and all of that yeah, and you know. i was wondering yeah. if you could um, so you also said that cities you know are defined also through time because of different either value systems or contextual problems yeah. and perhaps one of the biggest problems today might be the environmental one I'm wondering, yeah. you know, we all have these statistics in mind that cities yeah. are the most, um, are hosting most of the people, but also are responsible for most of the environmental effects. Yeah. So how, yeah. how do, how do we, we reconcile how these do two in your perhaps bipartite graphs or, you know, is there a, a, a new urban science in your head that can well, bring these two together? I think one of the great difficulties is that um, we have a massive, we have some massive disjunctions, massive disconnections between uh, the kind of science that I'm talking about here, uh, between cities in terms of building science, right? Okay, B building science, which is quite different from what I'm talking about. I mean, there are pals all talking about relationships, equations, and so on, but. Um, cities is building science uh, and then cities in terms of other systems that are clearly part of the city but treated in separate silos such as the environment and you can see why this is so because basically the environment is about environmental issues that the connection through to people and the way they're making impact on the environment is is an indirect one in some sense uh, as opposed to models of how people work in cities, which is much more direct. There are people literally working and producing things and moving around and going to work and shop and all that sort of thing. Very different from the impact that people have on the environment, which is more, in, it's more indirect in the sense of the modeling in that sense. And so consequently, and when it comes to ecosystems, basically, um, we had a number of books recently looking at cities as ecosystems, but none of them have ever been able to grasp this central notion that we're in the business of trying to relate people who live in cities to all of these different features of cities, which are, which are highly problematic, such as degradation of the environment, basically degradation of, of, of ecosystems and so on. Uh, climate change. Climate change is a little bit easier at one level because we do, you can see where we generate in terms of the way cities develop, where we where, where our carbon footprint is in this sense. Um, so that's one of the big issues that in some senses, uh, it's a different language and a different conceptual um, uh, focus that we put on with all of these different things. And it makes it very difficult to reconcile it in some sense um and so it's not that we don't understand that there are 
big issues related to people and the environment. It's just that I don't think we know quite how to think about um, our future as people working in cities and having an impact on the environment, basically. Um, I mean, if you take something like uh, climate change, if you take something like flooding, which has an immediate impact, you can see a strong physical representation of what goes on in cities in terms of land, land use and so on. Um, and you can see where we might be able to make predictions under what if type uh, scenarios about where places would flood. But, but actually doing something about it um, is a much bigger question that, that seeps into many other things that, you know, which, which really relate to the whole big picture. It's as though, it's as though we, we invent all these different things and they scale up and they produce these massive effects, which we, we have as climate change, that then come down again in very detailed focus, basically. And to do something about them, we need to somehow do something about the top level, basically, which is everything, really. So there are some real dilemmas involved in integrating ecosystems with um, uh, ecosystems with uh, environmental systems and so on. If you take um, metabolism, circular metabolism, and that kind of thing, I mean, waste, basically, or processes in cities, we can identify them in some senses, and we can think of some very simple ways of actually solving some of these problems related to, you know, waste disposal and so on, basically. Um, the issue, I think, is not um, necessarily uh, knowing how to solve them. We, we kind of, in an ideal world, know how to solve all these things. Um, but when we work it through into a plan, it becomes extremely problematic because it's highly ramified, um, it's highly political, it's, it very much depends on ideologies and so on uh, in this particular context. Whereas some of these other things in the science of cities are a little bit less so than that. I'm not saying that they're not ideological either. I think that uh, we need to think about these things a lot more in those terms. Not a very satisfactory answer, I don't think, to what to the question you posed, really, and says, but it it is it is in the nature of things that we need to think very hard about how we how we put together things that that we've talked about in a different language. You know, I can talk about environment and I can talk about a new science of cities, and you wouldn't think that that we were on the same I talk quite differently about lots of things about the environment. Uh, which we'd all agree about, and lots of things about the science of cities. But when we ask the question, how do we put all this stuff together, basically? How do we use these different insights? And that's a really big issue because it sort of presupposes that there may not be an integrated theory of everything out there, basically. <coughs> uh, uh, many people would believe that. I mean, I think we used to think that there could be integrated theories about everything, but I'm not convinced at all that that's the case. Um, and of course, we tend not to talk very much about that, so we don't know what people think. I, in my colleagues, for example, I, if I went round the table with our 12 lecturers, professors or whatever, and we had a debate about what they believed in, in terms of putting things together, um, uh, I, I, I think we get some very different uh, perceptions, uh, dependent on you know, their own history, their background, and a whole range of things, really, in that sense. So it makes it very hard to know how to proceed into this. Yeah, yeah as you say, I think, uh, I think I have this romantic idea of this integrative uh, approach somehow, but, you know, uh, when, when you start collaborating with cities as well, you, you also see how ill-equipped or ill-informed they are yeah. for dealing with yeah. these complex issues, which are local and global at the same time which are of different nature yeah. and all of that and uh, when they ask a number of questions you feel also ill-equipped as a researcher to provide a satisfactory answer because you know already that your answer just covers you know just the first layer of, of uh, as yeah, we said yeah. Uh, yeah. and so i think models still help to 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 at least you know help them understand either through cursors or whatever, so that they visualize this uh, 
this entity that lives uh, and that yeah. transforms and that if you do this, then there is a range of, uh, of things that change at the same time. Although we don't know where yeah. and how and how much. But uh, yeah, I, I feel that there is also a lack of tools of communication between the, the practice and the, the, the research somehow. Sure, sure, definitely. I mean, um, I, I think it's important to think about the implications of all of this, definitely. And we should do more writing about it, really, in that sense. I, I'm sure, I mean, this is, the, this is the issue about comparing different points of view and basically taking a much more pluralistic view uh, about how these things can be used in this particular context, used and implemented in that sense. Um, I think we have to, you know, apply things that are speculative and get things wrong as much as we get them right. And um, so that's always been the case, really, in a way. Um, and that's the way we might make some sort of progress. Yeah. Um, before we close the episode, I generally ask two questions. If you have any mm -hmm. uh, work or research that you want to spend some more time in 2022 that you'd like to share, and also do you have any books or articles or films that you would like to recommend to to go a bit deeper on this discussion of cities and complexities well there is a there is a book that we produced um about uh let's see uh, about the middle of last year i think called urban informatics uh -huh. it's an edited book by springer and it's open access right urban informatics it's a springer book uh, it's open access. You can download it all. And it deals with a very wide number of techniques, much wider than what we've talked about here. But there are some sections on what we've talked about here. It's mainly from the geomatic engineering GIS mm -hmm. point of view, this book. Uh, although there's a lot of articles in it that uh, uh, people looking at this podcast might be interested in. There's a very interesting article by Sidney uh -huh. Terrible from uh, Illinois dealing with, um, you know, industrial ecology, really, in that sense. So um, that would be worth doing. So just go to Google or any search engine and type in urban informatics. Great. She, S-I-H, basically, and it'll come up, basically. And you can download the book, basically, um, et cetera. So it's, uh, it's open access in that sense. So that might be quite useful to uh, some of the participants in the podcast, basically, in that sense. Also, you could have a look at our journal, Environment and Planning mm -hmm. B, um, which has got is getting a bit bigger at the present time. I mean, um, and it's fairly vibrant uh, in, in a sense. And there's lots of uh, new new ideas and new thinking. I think that we're trying to pick up in this area in that sense. Uh, but these are two things that you can do straight away, basically, really, and just by googling, you know, on the net in that sense. Yeah. Great. And uh, is there something that uh, you want to focus on for, for the, the rest of the year in terms of research or a new project or a new book or something like that? Well, yeah, what, what we're doing um, and what we have been doing in the last year really is we've had a task force looking at what is loosely called um, the digital transformation in planning, mm -hmm. basically. It's a digital task force related to uh, traditional planning what well, in Britain we call town and country planning in a sense, but it's urban planning, basically. And we've been looking at how the planning process and practice in Britain might be informed by new information technologies, by new uses of computers. Um, and um, uh, this task force, uh, you can download the report, it's open access, and you can download the report from a website called Digital for planning.com digital d-i-g-i-t-a-l four which is the mm. number four planning um all one word digital for planning all one word dot com and um uh, that really deals with what we think there's a group of ten of us a panel of ten members uh what we think should happen in the system in britain which is very very behind in many senses in terms of the application of information technologies uh, like I think in Switzerland and many other places 
uh, you have um, a planning system of sorts, which is probably similar to ours, where you have to apply for permissions um, for development and uh, they're matched against a plan. And that's the way the process works. The data that's contained in the planning permissions, there's something like well over half a million planning applications a year in Britain. There's 60 million people, well over half a million planning applications a year. And that's an enormous stack of data about what is actually being developed or not being developed um, in British cities. And it's data that is never used. And so some of our, some of our proposals are that this data be mobilized in some sense. It's, it's national data, it's uh, in the public domain, all this stuff, but there's not been the um, effort or money really, or resources required to actually do this. So our task force is really about how we begin to informate the urban planning process. Um, in a way that is much bigger and better than has ever been before. One of the things that we're very worried about, I think, in terms of the planning profession, is is that a, a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, thinking about um, planning is, is 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 lost in terms of the use of information technology. Information technologies models that we've been talking about here are not used really at all in a planning practice, basically, in that sense. Um, and so in some senses, the whole task force is really to make recommendations how this can be mobilized, really, in a sense, in that sense. I will definitely have a look. That looks very promising. We've been thinking about hopefully having this type of data set. So I'm very curious about how this looks. Well, okay. thanks so much, uh, Michael, for your time. Thanks as well for everyone to listening, watching until the end. And once again, don't hesitate to share this with fellow planners, computer scientists, or with colleagues, and tell us what you've learned today uh, in the comments. Thanks again. Thanks very much.